Howard W. Hunter is a very private man. He's as private a man as I've ever known. Spiritual depth is just unfathomable. His determination is almost flint-like. If the President Hunter tells you he's going to walk through a wall, my counsel is that you run on the other side and move whatever's there, because he'll go through it if he decides he's going to do it. And I was taking music lessons at the time, and he, we'd always sit down at the piano together, and he'd want to hear what I was learning, and I'd struggle with my one piece that I was memorizing at the time. And, and then he'd sit down and just, you know, play by ear, and I thought, oh, this man is so wonderful. <laughs> he's a good... Uh sometimes and a little bit of a kidder all eyes and ears turn in his direction when he makes a statement it's always been that way he has a, a deep spiritual sensitivity that's quiet and yet uh, at the moment can be expressed with great courage he is a man who loves the Lord who recognizes Jesus Christ as the living son of the living God. He has managed us to be very, very concerned about the little person. I was with him once when somebody came up to us and said, uh, do you remember me? Which is a really embarrassing question most of the time, but Dad looked for a minute and said, yes, I remember you. I met you in Paris as a missionary about five years ago and you told me that your mother was ill how is your mother I wish it were possible for everybody in the world especially the members of the church to know President Hunter as does his family and his brethren we express our appreciation for your attendance here today our purpose in inviting you here this morning is to announce that a new president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, President Howard William Hunter, was ordained and set apart in the Salt Lake Temple yesterday. I've shed many tears and have sought my Father in heaven in earnest prayer with a desire to be equal to the high and holy calling which is now mine. My greatest strength through these past hours and recent days has been my abiding testimony that this is the work of God and not man, that Jesus Christ is the authorized and living head of this church, and he leads it in a word and deed. I pledge my life, my strength, and the full measure of my soul to serving him fully. In 1853, Elder Orson Hyde stated, When an individual is ordained and appointed to lead the people, he has passed through tribulations and trials and has proven himself before God and his people that he is worthy of the situation which he holds. Someone that understands the spirit and counsel of the Almighty, that knows the church and is known of her, is the character that will lead the church. After 35 years in the Council of the Twelve Apostles, longer than any living man, Howard W. Hunter has been called to serve as the prophet, seer, and revelator of the Lord's restored church on earth. The story of his life is one of joy and sorrow, of uncommon patience in the face of adversity. It is a story illuminated by faith and hope. The story of a disciple of Christ. Just past the turn of the century, Boise, Idaho was bustling with growth. From 1900 to 1910, its population tripled to over 17,000. Automobiles were still a rarity, and the city streets hadn't yet been paved. But houses and businesses were springing up everywhere, 
and the city limits were being pushed outward. On the northeast corner of 11th and Sherman Streets, newlyweds Will and Nellie Hunter were renting their first home. Will had recently secured a job as motorman on the interurban electric railway that connected downtown Boise with communities west. Nellie was a refined, hard-working woman of 21. Together they worked to make their home a place of comfort and simple beauty. It was here on November 14, 1907, that their first child, a son they named Howard William, was born. When Howard was five months old, Nellie took him to fast and testimony meeting at the Boise branch, where the branch president, Heber Q. Hale, gave him a blessing. Nellie, who descended from pioneer ancestry, was an active member of the branch and made certain her children received religious instruction, both at church and at home. Though Will was not a member of the church, he did not stand in the way of his family's participation, and occasionally, when work permitted, he would accompany them to Sunday evening sacrament meetings. One of Howard's warmest memories is of coming home from sacrament meeting on the streetcar in the arms of his father. In 1909, the family moved around the corner to a larger home at 1012 Sherman Street. It was here that Howard's sister, Dorothy, was born. The next year, Will bought a quarter-acre lot just outside the city limits at the end of Vine Street, and soon he was busy constructing a three-room frame house for his family. Will bought a small hammer for two-year-old Howard and let his energetic son pound nails into the living room floor. In the fall of 1910, the family moved from Sherman Street to their new home. Since there was only one bedroom, Howard and Dorothy slept on cots on the south half of the porch. The north end was a pleasant place where the family could sit and visit on warm summer evenings. Will took great pride in his garden and meticulously cared for it. Once, Will allowed five-year-old Howard to weed the potato patch. When he checked his son's work that evening, he exclaimed, you've pulled up the potato plants. Howard, who had helped his father plant the potatoes, replied defensively, that is not where we planted them. Howard and his sister Dorothy were close. On hot summer days, they liked to cool off with their dog in a nearby irrigation ditch. Howard was always so good to me, Dorothy remembered. I have never known my brother to do a wrong thing in my life. Though Howard's father didn't have much formal education, he was well-read and had a keen curiosity about the world, which he passed on to his children. In the evenings, while Howard lay on the living room floor at his father's feet, Will would ask, where shall we travel tonight? Then, armed with an atlas and encyclopedias, they would explore exotic places of the world. At a very early age, Howard knew the capitals of the United States and many other countries. Both Nellie and Will read to their children, and Howard's and Dorothy's cards from the downtown Carnegie Library were well used. Dorothy devoured the Pollyanna series and the works of James Fenimore Cooper and Louisa May Alcott, while Howard read Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and the Tom Swift series. His sister remembers that Howard was admired by adults for his good manners. He would tip his cap to people on the street and give up his seat on the streetcar if anyone was standing. Women would comment, I wish my son were like that. He treated Dorothy with the same respect as other girls, usually. One day after going with Howard and one of his school friends, Beatrice, down to the river, Dorothy came home in a rage. When her mother asked, what's wrong? Dorothy replied, he held the barbed wire up longer for Beatrice than for me. In January 1914, Howard entered Lowell Elementary, about a mile from home. It was here that he discovered an unusual handicap. I had a problem telling colors, he recalled. Not all of them, but shades of red, green, and brown. Six-year-old Howard devised an ingenious way around his problem. 
Howard would arrange his crayons at the top of his desk, and then when the teacher asked the children to pick up a certain color, he would move his finger across the crayons. Beatrice Beach, his little friend, sat behind him, and uh, when he reached the right one, she would tap him on the shoulder to indicate such. He was too embarrassed to tell his teacher that he didn't know how to recognize colors. From his earliest childhood, Howard possessed an unusual work ethic for one so young, and adults seemed to sense that he was conscientious and dependable. He delivered telegrams, sold newspapers, and for a time worked as a cash boy at the Cash Bazaar, a Boise department store. When a clerk made a sale and rang a bell, Howard would run to pick up the goods and the money, take them to the cashier who wrapped the purchase and made change, then dash back to the clerk who gave the package and change to the waiting customer. He was paid one dollar for a 12-hour day. As Latter-day Saints, Howard and Dorothy were in the minority at school, and he remembers it wasn't very popular to say that you were a Mormon. But Howard had a testimony, one that had developed from earliest childhood. I knew that God lived, he remembered. My mother had taught me to pray and to thank Heavenly Father for all the things that I enjoyed. I often thanked him for the beauty of the earth and for the wonderful times that I had at the ranch and by the river and with the scouts. I also learned to ask him for the things that I wanted or needed. Will felt his children should wait until they were older to be baptized. As a result, Howard's 12th birthday came and went and he was unable to pass the sacrament with the other boys in the ward. Howard repeatedly begged his father for permission and finally, on April 4th, 1920, he and Dorothy were baptized in the natatorium, a large indoor swimming complex. Eleven weeks later, on June 21st, Howard was ordained a deacon by his bishop, Alfred Hoganson. I remember the first time I passed the sacrament, he said. I was frightened, but thrilled to have the privilege. After the meeting, the bishop complimented me on the way I had conducted myself. When Howard became a deacon, the Boy Scouts of America had only been in existence ten years, but the movement was spreading rapidly, and he was eager to become involved. Howard worked hard on his merit badges, and after earning 32, he became the second Eagle Scout in Boise. When Howard was 15, the Saints and Boise met to discuss a proposal to build a tabernacle to serve a growing church membership. When an appeal was made for pledges, Howard raised his hand and made the first one, $25, a substantial sum for that time, especially for a teenager. I worked and saved until I was able to pay my commitment in full, he remembers. He was present two years later when the completed tabernacle was dedicated by President Heber J. Grant. In January 1922, Howard entered Boise High School, where he took such subjects as French, English, ancient and American history, physics, and algebra. In addition to his studies, he increased even more his ambitious work schedule. Dorothy remembers that her brother always had a job, sometimes several at once. During his teen years, he worked as a caddy at the Idaho Country Club, about four miles from his home. Howard rode his bike to the club, often going early to dive in the lake for golf balls. He received 10 cents for each one recovered. Later, he worked at a pharmacy downtown, serving customers at the soda fountain and delivering prescriptions on his bicycle. In high school, Howard landed a job at the downtown Idenhaw Hotel. He ran the elevator and served as a bellboy the first hour and relieved the switchboard operator the next hour. Then it was time to put on a porter's uniform and go to the train station to meet arriving guests and help them with their baggage. While they registered at the hotel, he changed back into his bellboy's uniform and showed them to their rooms. For the last part of his shift, he changed into work clothes and emptied waste baskets, cleaned and polished cuspidors, and mopped the lobby floor. Sometimes, young people he knew came into the hotel on their way to dances. I was always embarrassed, he said, 
for them to see me in my maintenance clothes. At an early age, Howard discovered a talent for music, and by the time he reached high school, he could play at least five instruments. He began playing saxophone and clarinet with several dance orchestras, and in 1924, he organized his own group, Hunter's Crunaders. Hunter's Crunaders were a really hot group. They played dance gigs from uh, Caldwell, Idaho, clear up into Idaho City, and, and once or twice they even went over into Oregon. Uh, they had dance jobs er almost every weekend. In fact, sometimes they even played twice in one day. Uh, one year they played over 100 dance jobs in a period of 10 months. Howard graduated from Boise High School on June 3rd, 1926, and that summer he became assistant to the soda fountain manager at Baloo Latimer Drug Company. Toward the end of 1926, Howard received an unusual offer, a contract to provide a five-piece orchestra for a two-month cruise to the Orient on the passenger liner SS President Jackson. For a young man whose only travel had been to relatives in Utah and California, this was a rare opportunity to see the world and at the same time earn money for college. Howard selected four musicians, and after rehearsing for several days, they traveled together by train to Seattle, where the ship was docked. At 11 a.m. on January the 5th, 1927, the gangplank was pulled, and the SS President Jackson headed into the Pacific. As night fell, Howard and his friends stood on deck with the other passengers, watching as the last lighthouse disappeared from view. It would be their last smooth sailing, for a long time. That night, a major midwinter storm struck the North Pacific. Nearly everyone on board is seasick, Howard reported. It was said the captain is seasick for the first time in 25 years. Six days later, the ship was still tossing wildly, but at last the seas became calmer. On Thursday, January 13th, the ship crossed the international date line, entering the Eastern Hemisphere and that evening, Hunter's Crewnaders played their first gala party. From then on, there was a full schedule of programs, dances, and parties. Hunter's Crewnaders also provided background music for movies shown on board. Early on the morning of January 17th, the ship eased through Tokyo Harbor and docked at Yokohama. As soon as they were given shore leave, Howard and two of his companions headed for Tokyo. In his journal, he wrote, Tokyo is a beautiful city, and the people seem friendly, but they are in mourning because of the recent death of Emperor Yoshihito. His body is lying in state at a large Buddhist temple near the royal palace. We were able to go through the temple and see the emperor. Next morning, after a tour of earthquake-ravaged Yokohama, Howard wrote, People here dress differently, act differently, and are very curious about those of us who wear Western clothes and speak a different language. Sailing through Japan's inland sea, he stood on the deck and saw brilliant green mountains and a sea swarming with sailboats, sampans, and junks, all a stark contrast to the world he knew back in Boise. From there it was on to Shanghai, China's largest city, where Howard and his companions found the country on the brink of revolution. In his journal, Howard wrote, There seems to be a deep feeling against foreigners. I went into the city with a friend, but returned to the ship early because we were uneasy. Tonight, two of the seamen on our ship came back badly beaten. After docking at Hong Kong, the ship traveled on to Manila in the Philippines. Then it reversed its course and began traveling eastward, Howard had been away from home for over a month. As the ship left Yokohama, he wrote, We are leaving behind the fascinating Orient, and in 11 days, we will be back in the United States. On Friday, March 11th, 10 weeks and one day after they had boarded the train in Boise, their journey ended. It was early in the morning when we got to Boise. I called mother and dad and they came to get me. Home never looked as good to me as it did when we got there. Howard was thrilled when he returned to learn that his father had been baptized in his absence. 
The next Sunday, he proudly accompanied his father to their first priesthood meeting together. Howard lost no time in finding jobs. Before long, he was selling shoes at Falk's department store in downtown Boise and playing dance engagements nearly every night. But a restlessness was growing that caused him to turn his sights west. In March of 1928, he went to Southern California to visit his friend Bill Salisbury. He stayed with his aunt and uncle in Huntington Park and found a job at the Sunkist Packing House in Upland. Three weeks after he arrived, he recorded, When I came to California, I thought I would stay a week with Bill and then go home. But since being here, I've decided there are advantages in California, if I can find employment with opportunity. Finally, he reached a decision. As I have looked around Los Angeles and considered job opportunities, I have come to the conclusion that I would like to work in a bank. On Monday morning, April 23rd, he went to California's largest bank, the Bank of Italy, and applied for a job. He was hired immediately. The next day, he began working at the bank's main office in downtown Los Angeles. He also became a member of the Huntington Park Ward, within walking distance of his uncle's home. Howard Hunter was one of over two million people who moved to California during the 1920s, a time of unprecedented growth. People were flocking to Southern California from all over the country. It would become known as the first westward migration of the automobile age. Eager to get ahead in his new career, Howard enrolled for a banking class after work on Tuesdays and Thursday evenings at the American Institute of Banking. Here, he met Ned Redding, a member of the church who had recently returned from the North Central States Mission. Ned was taking the same banking class, and they soon became close friends. Within a short time, Howard was as busy as he had been in Boise. His parents shipped his musical instruments to him, and that summer, he signed on as drummer for a dance band that also had a contract to perform on radio. Even though he had a busy life socially, as well as worked uh, five and a half days a week and, and was going to church on Sunday, if he had a free minute, he always picked up a book and, and would read. In his journal, he talks many times about going to the library and picking up a book of Shakespeare. Uh, one evening, he mentions that he uh, stayed home and read the lives of the 12 greatest philosophers in the world. Uh, he just had a great insatiable desire to know about uh, world, the world, religion, philosophy, and uh, every other subject you can imagine. In the meantime, Howard's parents had moved to Los Angeles. Howard moved in with them, and his church membership records were transferred to the Adams Ward. There he became a home teacher, was assigned by the Eldest Quorum president to visit sick members, served as counselor in the Eldest Quorum presidency, and eventually as ward scoutmaster. About this time, Howard also began an in-depth study of the scriptures and other gospel-related books. But it was in the young adult Sunday school class that he experienced a major turning point in his hunger for gospel knowledge. In his history, he wrote, Although I had attended church classes most of my life, my first real awakening to the gospel came in a Sunday school class in Adams Ward taught by Peter A. Clayton. He had a wealth of knowledge and the ability to inspire young people. I studied the lessons, read the outside assignments he gave us, and participated in speaking on assigned subjects. I suddenly became aware of the real meaning of the gospel. I think of this period of my life as the time the truths of the gospel commenced to unfold. I always had a testimony, but suddenly I began to understand. In March of 1930, in the mission home next to the Adams Ward, 22-year-old Howard Hunter received his patriarchal blessing from George T. Wright, stake patriarch. The blessing stated that Howard was one whom the Lord foreknew and that he had shown strong leadership among the hosts of heaven and had been ordained to perform an important work in mortality. On June 8, 1928, 12 weeks after he arrived in Los Angeles, Howard attended an M. Men and Gleaner dance at the Wilshire Ward. Afterwards, Howard and some of his friends decided to go to the beach. Among the group were Ned Redding and his date Clara Mae Jeffs. 
They all went wading in the surf near Santa Monica with the young women holding up their long evening gowns. That night, Howard got better acquainted with Claire, and he remembers, the next time we went out, I took Claire and Ned went with someone else. A three-year courtship began to unfold, and in the spring of 1931, Howard wrote in his history, we drove to Palos Verdes and parked on the cliffs where we could watch the waves roll in and break over the rocks in the light of a full moon. We talked about our plans, and I put a diamond ring on her finger. We made many decisions that night and some strong resolutions regarding our lives. The couple decided to be married in the Salt Lake Temple in June. As his wedding day approached, Howard made another major decision. Well, Dad was a musician and a really good musician as a matter of fact he used to play around the home and uh, it was a uh, profession that he loved and he was good at it uh, but the value system uh, he thought of musicians that uh, played late at night and at dances and uh, nightclubs and that kind of thing was different than the value system that he wanted to have and about the time that he got married he decided that it would be better for him to um, put away that profession. On June 6, 1931, four days before his wedding, Howard played his last engagement at the Virginia Ballroom in Huntington Park. After he got home that night, he packed up his saxophones and clarinets and his music and put them away. From that night, except for a few rare family gatherings, he never touched them again. Uh, it was always remarkable to me that he could do that, that a profession that he loved and a, um, a vocation and a talent that he had, he could simply put away and, and uh, because he felt that other values were more important. On Wednesday morning, June 10th, 1931, Howard William Hunter and Clara Mae Jeffs received their endowments and were sealed for time and eternity. Howard and Claire began married life in a furnished apartment overlooking the ocean at Hermosa Beach. But as the Great Depression moved into its second year, banks across the country were forced to close. In January of 1932, Howard's employment at the bank suddenly came to a halt. To earn money, Howard packaged and sold soap door to door ran a surveying transit, and painted highway bridges for Claire's father. While painting bridges, Howard and his brother-in-law camped out, and Claire went along to wash and cook for them. In January 1934, Howard was offered a job in the title department of the Los Angeles County Flood Control District. Two months later, he and Claire became the parents of their first child, a son, whom they named Howard William Hunter, Jr. Howard's work with the County Flood Control District involved many legal matters, and this fueled his desire to obtain a law degree. After studying the programs of several colleges, he decided to enroll at Southwestern University, California's largest law school. He would keep his job and attend classes there at night. He enrolled for 10 credit hours, a heavy load for someone who worked full-time. His weekday schedule consisted of studying on the bus and streetcar on the way to the office, working from 8 to 5, with more studying at noon, eating an apple and memorizing as he walked several blocks to the university, attending classes from 6 to 9, studying on the ride home, eating dinner with Claire after 10, then studying again until midnight, or often later. On evenings when he was too tired to stay up and study, he would set the alarm clock to wake him up earlier in the morning. He followed this schedule for the next five years. My father has an amazing capacity for, uh, for work. He has always had the ability to do more than the average person, and people have commented about that. I think about my aunt also and what she, what she went through, a sacrifice that she made for him because I'm sure that those times were very lonesome for her and uh, 
Yet she realized it was something that he wanted to do, a goal that the two of them had set for him to be become a lawyer. And so I think you have to hand it to both of them for, for what they did. That summer, as Howard was keeping his strenuous schedule, he and Claire noticed that something was not right with their baby son, Billy. He seemed weak and lethargic. After several tests and transfusions, doctors discovered that an intestinal diverticulum had ulcerated. They recommended surgery. Howard was taken into the operating room on a table beside his son and gave blood during the operation. At the conclusion, the doctors were not encouraging. Howard and Claire stayed with him constantly for the next 72 hours. On the evening of the third day, October 11th, 1934, he slipped quietly away as they sat by his bed. Howard wrote, we were grief-stricken and numb as we left the hospital into the night. Two days later, after a comforting service, the earthly body of Howard William Hunter, Jr., was laid to rest next to his grandfather, Jeff's. It was a very difficult time for all of us. He was a very precious child, and living with him from day to day, you get very close to them. Howard has been tried a lot during his life, and that was probably his first trial, his first very difficult trial, something he had no control over. I know that they grieved very much, and it's times like this that our faith gets us, gets us through, and I know that that was for them, knowing that uh, they would have him again and that he would be waiting for them. Death seems to touch him deeply. And it may be because he lost Billy at such a tender age and had to deal with that when he himself was quite young. Less than two years later, a second son, John Jacob, was born. And in 1938, their family circle was completed with the birth of Richard Allen. Law school came to an end in June 1939. At commencement exercises in the Hollywood Memorial Auditorium, Howard was graduated third in his class and received his degree cum laude. The week after graduation, he began a bar review course given by one of his professors in preparation for the California bar examination. At the last session, Howard said the professor told his students that when they sat down to write the examination, they should take a good look at the man on the right and the man on the left and realize that out of the three, only one would receive a passing grade. Howard described the examination as one of the most grueling experiences of my life. It spanned three days. After the third day, I was completely exhausted, he said. I had done my best, but there was the anxiety of not knowing if that was good enough. On the morning of December 12th, Claire called him at the office and said the postman had just brought a letter from the committee of bar examiners. I closed my eyes, he said, and waited for her to open the letter. He had passed. The hard work and sacrifices we had made, he said, were at a successful conclusion. In ceremonies at a session of the California Supreme Court, Howard W. Hunter took the oath of office and was sworn in and admitted to practice law before the courts of the state. That winter, he rented space in the downtown Los Angeles office of attorney James P. Bradley, and immediately, his legal practice began to grow. On August 27, 1940, Bertram M. Jones, president of the Pasadena Stake, called and asked Howard to meet with him and his counselors that evening. When he arrived, they explained that the Alhambra Ward was going to be divided and the Hunters would be members of the new El Sereno Ward. Then he called Howard to serve as bishop of that ward. I was stunned, Howard said. I had always thought of a bishop as being an older man, and I asked how I could be the father of a ward at age 32. They said I would be the youngest bishop that had been called in Southern California to that time, but they knew I could be equal to the assignment. I told them I would do my best. His first assignments were to find a meeting place for the new ward and begin staffing. He and his counselors arranged for a rented space on the second level of the Florence building in El Sereno 
and then began the task of organizing a new ward from scratch. Among the first persons called was Claire, who was asked to serve as supervisor of the junior Sunday school. About this time, Howard, Claire, and their family moved into a larger home at 3419 Winchester Avenue in El Sereno. They converted one of the bedrooms into an office and library, which Howard said made a nice room for interviews and other work as bishop. Because the ward had no chapel of its own, this home became the center of the ward's social life. I have a really happy childhood memory of, of that ward. I do remember that there was a bakery downstairs, and that, that bakery used to bake um, purposely on Sunday, I think, and the, and the smells of, of cookies and baked goods came up into, the, into our building. The El Sereno Ward during World War II was known as the Onion Ward. Uh, during the week, the members of the church would go to the uh, nearby pickle factory where they would trim onions, uh, trying to raise funds for their new building. Uh, President Hunter in his journal mentioned that uh, you could always tell if a person had been out trimming onions because of the odor during sacrament meeting. It was just kind of a thing after you passed the sacrament, uh, one by one we'd file out the back door. We didn't all get up at the same time, it was too obvious, but you'd just kind of each one work your way out and go down to the, to the mall shop. And my uncle sat there for a minute and then he stood up and he told everybody that sacrament meeting was going to be delayed for a few minutes and that he would be right back. He just came down and said, uh, when you boys are finished with your malts, we'll continue sacrament meeting. And needless to say, we got them finished pretty fast. <laughs> they all followed the bishop right upstairs and he never had that problem again. On November 10th, 1946, Howard was released after more than six years of service. A former member of the ward, Charles Pulsifer, remembers. As bishop, he brought our small membership together and taught us to accomplish goals that seemed beyond our reach. In 1948, Howard and Claire sold their house in El Sereno and moved into a new home at 940 Paloma Drive in Arcadia. These were happy years for the hunters with two active and healthy sons, a growing law practice, and the support of a loving ward. Family home meeting was always a part of our family. My brother and I uh, were usually in charge of the program, and, and we even made up printed programs. Uh, and it usually consisted of a, a song, and oftentimes my father would play the piano. And uh, then we had uh, a program of some sort, maybe a scripture or some activity. And we did that when we were little children. We had a lot of freedom in our home, uh, but Dad always thought that if we knew the difference between right and wrong, that we'd be able to do, uh, we'd be able to make the choices and do what was right. And so we, we had uh, plenty of opportunity. I can remember once that uh, I announced to my folks, I must have been six years old or seven, that uh, I wasn't gonna go to church anymore. And I can remember Dad said, well, you know what the Lord expects, and you are old enough now to make your decision as to what you're going to do, and you think about it, and we'll wait for you out in the car. So they left and sat out in the car for a minute or two until I decided what to do, and I went out and got in the car with them, and we all went to church together. I know when I was in law school, we all heard about President Hunter before we had ever met him, and uh, it was always in the most laudatory terms. He spent an enormous amount of energy and time uh, working with small clients, individuals, for example, uh, some of whom couldn't afford to pay. Uh, and he did that, I think, more because he loved people than for any other reason. But he had this unique capacity to blend uh, representation of people who needed it and to give them the care and concern that, uh, that uh, only he could give them. In 1948, a fellow attorney recommended Howard to the governor of California to fill a vacancy on the bench in one of the state courts. Howard declined. My law practice is treating me well, he said, and I want the freedom to work in the church and carry on my own interests. In February 1950, elders Stephen L. Richards and Harold B. Lee were assigned to divide the Pasadena stake. It was nearly midnight after many interviews on Saturday, February 25th, 
when the two apostles sent for Howard W. Hunter and called him to be the president of the Pasadena stake. Then Howard reported, I was told to go home, get a good night's sleep, and call them in the morning by six o'clock with my recommendation for counselors. I went home, but I didn't sleep. The calling was overwhelming. Claire and I talked for a long time. At the Sunday morning session of state conference held in the Monrovia High School Auditorium, Howard W. Hunter was sustained as the new president of the Pasadena Stake. He would become the spiritual leader of over four and a half thousand Latter-day Saints from Pasadena East to the San Bernardino County line, a distance of more than 20 miles. President Hunter uh, took that stake and presided over an era, era of enormous growth uh, in terms of population, enormous growth in terms of buildings and the capacity to house the people that needed to be housed, and of course training and building leaders that could then carry on the church in the Southern California area. And he was extremely successful in doing all of those things. In addition to his duties as president of a large stake, Howard was called in 1952 to serve as chairman of the Regional Council of Stake Presidents. The region extended from San Luis Obispo on the north to the Mexican border on the south, encompassing 12 stakes and approximately 65,000 members. Howard was responsible for coordinating and giving direction for numerous projects and activities, ranging from extensive welfare holdings and the building of the second largest temple in the church to music and dance festivals and leadership conferences. Often, he pitched in and worked along with the saints in the region on welfare projects. He did his share. If we went out on the state welfare farm, <laughs> there were skilled assignments passed out, <laughs> and the rest of us unskilled laborers, which he and I were both one, we took whatever job was there, and he took it, whether it was cleaning out the chicken coops or weeding the carrots or whatever it was. I have never been on a gloomy welfare project, he recalled. But what I remember most are the laughing and the singing and the good fellowship of people engaged in the service of the Lord. Our son was a great teacher. And a lot of the teaching was done at his home because at that, that time, the stake presidents were the only ones that issued, interviewed on, for temple recommends, approved temple recommends. That gave him an opportunity to teach the gospel to these people, to tell them about the temple, answer their questions about the temple. And he would spend a lot of time with them. And out of it, these people developed a very close tie to him. President Hunter was a wonderful state president. We all appreciated him so very much while he served here. In many of the activities and the social get-togethers that we had over there, he and that dear wife of his would never leave until the kitchen was cleaned and everyone was out of there, many times helped with doing the dishes after these social gatherings. People admired him for that and loved him. He was just such a dear, dear close friend to all of us. On Howard's 46th birthday, an important and memorable event took place in the Arizona temple. Howard was speaking to members of his stake in the chapel as part of a special temple excursion when his mother and father dressed in white, entered the room. I had no idea that Father was prepared for his temple blessings, he wrote. I was so overcome with emotion that I was unable to speak. This was a birthday I have never forgotten because on that day they were endowed and I had the privilege of witnessing their sealing, following which I was sealed to them. In his history, Howard wrote, 1959 commenced as to what appeared to be a quiet year. What he did not know is that before it ended, it would be one of the most momentous years of his life. On Friday, October 9th, Howard arrived in Salt Lake City to attend sessions of the semi-annual General Conference of the Church. At the conclusion of the first session, he received word that President David O. McKay would like to meet with him. Howard walked to the church administration building where he was ushered into the president's office. President McKay greeted me with a pleasant smile and a warm handshake, Howard remembers. 
Then he said to me, sit down, President Hunter. I want to talk with you. The Lord has spoken. You're called to be one of his special witnesses. And tomorrow, you will be sustained as a member of the Council of the Twelve. I cannot attempt to explain the feeling that came over me. Tears came to my eyes, and I could not speak. I had never felt so completely humbled as when I sat in the presence of this great, sweet, kindly man, the prophet of the Lord. He told me that hereafter my life and time would be devoted as a servant of the Lord, and I would hereafter belong to the church and the whole world. I went back to the hotel and called Claire. But when she answered the phone, I could hardly talk. Howard returned to the afternoon session of conference, but I soon became so nervous, he said, that I left the tabernacle and went for a walk up the hill to the state capitol and got back just before the conclusion of the session. That evening, Howard and his son John went to the annual football game between the University of Utah and Brigham Young University. He sat through the game and, and uh, stared at the 50-yard line, even though there was a lot of action at the goal lines. And it even looked for a while that, Ut uh, that BYU might win. Of course, they didn't. After the game was over, I uh, just assumed he had no interest in football. But, uh, but he told me, let's go back to the hotel. I have something to tell you. When we got back, he told me that he had been called as an apostle. That night, Howard and Claire talked for a long time before retiring. The next day, he was sustained as a member of the Twelve. My heart pounded as I climbed the steps, he said. Elder Hugh B. Brown moved over to make room for me, and I took my place as the twelfth member of the quorum. I felt the eyes of everyone fastened upon me, as well as the weight of the world on my shoulders. As the conference proceeded, I was most uncomfortable and wondered if I could ever feel that this was my proper place. The call brought great changes into the lives of Elder Hunter and his wife, Claire. After 30 years in California, they left their business associates, church members, and cherished friends. In his journal, Howard wrote, I have thoroughly enjoyed the practice of law, but this call will far overshadow the pursuit of the profession or monetary gain. At the time of his call, he was a prominent attorney in Los Angeles. He was a director of a number of corporations and had all of the worldly things that one would expect or hope for in a future that would promise him even more. And then the call came. And like Peter, who left his nets and answered the call of the Lord, so Howard Hunter left all of that behind and gave his full life, his full attention, his full consecration to the ministry to which he'd been called as an apostle. Righteous leadership has been needed in every dispensation of time, and God chose prophets for this purpose long before they came into this mortal existence. We remember the With his call to the Quorum of the Twelve, Elder Hunter's schedule and use of time took on an added urgency. From that time on, he would bear witness of Jesus Christ, build up the church, ordain and set apart thousands of leaders, and proclaim the gospel to members and non-members on six continents and many islands of the sea. We'd had a long, hard day in Cairo. We were dusty and tired and had appointments for the evening, and we were sharing a hotel room. He was elder hunter then, and I said, Elder Hunter, is it okay if I just stretch out and have a little nap uh, before the evening appointments? And he said, of course. And I wakened prematurely and found him uh, uh, cleaning and shining my shoes. The only concern he had was that he wished he'd have gotten them done before I wakened, and he could have tucked them snugly under the bed. During the 1960s and 70s, his assignments were diverse and far-reaching. He served as president of the Genealogical Society of Utah. He also served as president of the Polynesian Cultural Center in Hawaii and as the church historian. The Middle East also became an area of special attention and interest for Elder Hunter. 
By 1993, he had visited nearly every Islamic nation in the world, some of them several times. He had also visited the Holy Land more than any other general authority, making some two dozen trips to conduct church business and meet with heads of state. During these visits, he became a close and trusted friend of Jerusalem Mayor Teddy Kolek. If you meet him, you can't not trust him. It's uh, as simple as all that, you know. With all my uh, high regard for the Mormon Church and its members and the way uh, you all behave, he is even quieter and even, if possibly, more simple, more direct uh, than all of you, and that is very impressive. In 1979, Elder Hunter was appointed by the First Presidency to oversee the site selection and construction of the Brigham Young University Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies. Well, it's absolutely certain that there would be no Brigham Young University Jerusalem Center without the vision and foresight, the single-mindedness of uh, President Howard W. Hunter. And uh, I don't know that he could have anticipated, I don't think he anticipated, I know we didn't anticipate the challenges, the obstacles, the seemingly insurmountable problems uh, that we faced in building that center. There were times when uh, it was very, very difficult to, to proceed, but President Hunter always, always uh, gave us strength and courage by saying, let's go forward, let's go forward. Let's not take counsel from our fears. And as a result, uh, we have what is generally conceded to be, uh, even by Mayor Kulik, as uh, perhaps the most beautiful building built in Jerusalem in the last uh, half century. Entering the second decade of his ministry, Elder Hunter found an increasing need for patience and self-mastery, as first his beloved Claire, and then he himself experienced major health problems. In the early 1970s, Claire's health began to decline, and a series of debilitating strokes finally left her bedridden and greatly diminished. And in her long illness, what uh, an angel he was in tenderly caring for her all during the days of uh, her illness. Uh, that was an example to all of the church. Howard would many times cut short his trips. He would travel all night. He would work harder than he had to so he could get home that extra day to be with her. And when he would walk in that front door, she would light up. She wouldn't do that for any other person. But when she would see him, she would just beam. In 1983, after more than a dozen years of tender care from her beloved companion, Claire Jeffs Hunter was called home. Said Elder James E. Faust, I have never seen such an example of devotion of a husband to his wife. It has been a many splendid love affair. He's a man who's known much of suffering and that has had a tempering influence upon his life. He's known much of personal sorrow and in his problems with his health, he has walked through the valley of the shadow of death uh, on more than one occasion. He's a living miracle. He was told that uh, he would be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. It's a miracle that he walks. And that, I think, is, is because of his, his indomitable will, his personal, personal strength. And all who have heard his voice, all who have witnessed his coming to the podium, have witnessed a miracle in our time. We were conscious of the years when he was alone and how grateful we were when Ines came along. She brought a sparkle back into his life and is a great blessing to him. He's been blessed with two wonderful companions, each one of them filling the, the need in his life at the time. His wife, Ines, has been a great blessing to him. She meets the people well, and she has a testimony, and she enjoys bearing that testimony right along with President Hunter bearing his. 
when they meet with the membership of the church in many locations. On June 5, 1994, after serving six years as president of the Quorum of the Twelve, Howard W. Hunter was called, ordained, and set apart as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But there's an old phrase from a popular movie, who honors God, God honors. Howard W. Hunter has always honored God, and God has honored him. It's a joy for me to be his counselor, to sit by his side, and to partake of his wisdom and his inspiration, and to carry to the very best of my ability the assignments which he gives to me. He's a man of God, and I so testify. The Lord uses a very interesting process to get a prophet in this church. He uh, selects a young man, evidently, of promise, and then schools him and trains him and disciplines him through a variety of exercises extending over a long period of years and refines him and hones him and prepares him for this great and sacred calling. As I look backward and uh, see what's happened in my life, I have a better understanding of the transformation that takes place in the lives of people who espouse the truth and are willing to follow the counsel of the church. I've had a testimony since a child of the truthfulness of the gospel. My mother was from parentage that came from the old country, from Denmark, and with firm testimonies. And I think I have inherited some of that and uh, tried to be equal to it. And I think being a young bishop has taught me many lessons. I feel like the children in their classes of primary who have learned to bear their testimony. I have that same feeling that the gospel is true. It's more than a feeling, it's a knowledge that it is true, that God lives. He hears and answers our prayers. As a special witness of Christ, I give you my solemn testimony that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God. He lives and this is his church. He leads it today. Of this I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Onto your souls. You know, Stan, I was talking to Susie the other day, and she and Ted are going to this cabin. Stan? Stan? What? What? When we started out, I thought everything was going to be so perfect. But things change, and just don't know how to make them right again. shall be unto thee an everlasting light. Most of my life I felt like I was lost, like I was in the dark. And sometimes you lose hope that you'll ever find your way again.
As a shepherd seeketh his flock that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them. All I know is, you gotta watch out for yourself. You can't count on anybody. I used to have a lot of faith. Then this happened. And now I just try to get through the days. Life just isn't fair. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. When someone you really love dies, it changes everything. You want to believe that it's not the end. The invitation to come unto Christ and learn of Him has been extended by the Savior Himself and by all His prophets and apostles in every age. Such repeated invitations recorded and preserved for us in the Holy Scriptures give hope, direction, answers to our problems. Through the Scriptures, we can hear the voice of the Lord speaking to us, and as we come unto Him, we can find peace and safety. The writers of the scriptures, the prophets, knew that we must understand God's plan and the Savior's role in that plan if we are to have eternal happiness. We are all children of our Heavenly Father. He has placed us in this beautiful world and has provided us with all that we need to grow, progress, and be happy. Being part of an earthly family, experiencing love and caring relationships can help us understand a little of what our Heavenly Father feels. In some small way, the love and feeling we have as parents for our children is representative of God's much greater love and feeling for all of us. We are His children, His sons and His daughters, and His love for us is unfailing. Our Heavenly Father has prepared a plan that will bring us joy in this life and allow us to return to His presence and live with Him forever. Jesus Christ, his beloved son, has the central role in that plan. Throughout history, our Heavenly Father has chosen special witnesses of these truths, known as prophets. He revealed his teachings to them and commanded them to record his words. Their writings, which have been compiled into the scriptures, help us as children of our Heavenly Father to understand his plan and our relationship to Jesus Christ. The teachings of Christ to the people in the old world are found in the Bible. Old Testament prophets foretold of his coming. The New Testament contains a record of his birth, mortal ministry, death, and resurrection. Learning of him, being able to see his example and experience his teachings helps us know how we should live our lives and gives us hope that through him we can return again to our heavenly home. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for 
of heirs is the kingdom of heaven. The atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest manifestation of God's love ever demonstrated in the history of this world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. From Adam to the end of the world, all of us, every person who has ever lived, will receive the benefit and gift of Christ's atoning death and living resurrection. He atoned for our sins, made payment for our mistakes, and offers us a way back from darkness, despair, and death. Because he lives, because he rose triumphant from the tomb, and took on new life, restored life, immortal life, so will we. Every one of us will also be resurrected because of his gift to us 
the gift of eternal life. The truths of which we have been speaking are taught in the scriptures. The Bible, the Old and New Testaments, are a record of Christ's ministry and teachings in the old world. But in that record, Jesus refers to others to whom he would minister, others who would also need to know of the atonement, the resurrection, the great plan of happiness. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. There is a record of Jesus Christ and his ministry among these other sheep. It contains the writings of other prophets who also told of his coming. It gives an account of his ministry and teachings among these people. The Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. We have, therefore, two records, two witnesses for Christ. The Bible, which the Apostle John said was written, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the Book of Mormon, which another prophet said was written, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. Just as the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ, so too does the Book of Mormon. It testifies that he's the Son of God, that he atoned for our sins, and that he was resurrected from the dead, setting a pattern for all of us to follow. It also provides a marvelous account of his ministry to the people in the new world following his resurrection in Jerusalem. And now it came to pass that there were a great multitude gathered together. And behold, they saw a man descending out of heaven. And he came down and stood in the midst of them. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And behold, I am the light and the life of the world. chosen from among you to minister unto you and to be your servants. your little ones.
As you read the Book of Mormon, you'll find what I find, Christ, healing and helping and blessing and lifting. He is in every way the commanding central figure of this additional testament of his love and his teachings. In this book, as in the Bible, he bids us come unto him to lay our burdens and sorrows at his feet and to receive strength, his strength. If you are searching for peace and happiness, this record of Christ's love and forgiveness will touch your soul with strength and spirit. The Book of Mormon contains a marvelous promise which states that if you'll study, ponder, and pray about the teachings it contains, you will receive a witness from the Holy Ghost that these teachings are true. That witness comes as a feeling of peace, comfort, warmth, and joy. Perhaps you've felt those feelings as we've been discussing the sacred role of Jesus Christ. I invite you to study the Book of Mormon, as have millions of others, and receive a confirmation that it is the Word of God. As you read, you will find that it witnesses, along with the Bible, of the essential redeeming role of our Savior Jesus Christ and His invitation, Come unto me. Whosoever will come, him will I receive. I mean, it's like I'm talking to you, you're not even listening to me. Talk, talk, talk. We've accomplished nothing. Sue, I love you, but I don't understand what is going on. And I don't think that you do either. Well, at least I'm trying to. Stan! Good night. Fine, sleep on the couch. See if I care. forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope. of the world, a life 
that is endless, that can never be darkened. A life which is endless, that there can be no more death. The prophets have always testified of Christ, and they still do today. Our Heavenly Father continues to reveal himself to his servants, and in our own time, another prophet, Joseph Smith, has recorded this powerful witness of Christ. And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, which we give of him, that he lives, for we saw him even on the right hand of God. And we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him, and through him and of him the worlds are and were created and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. I add my witness of Christ to those which have been born down through the ages. I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and as such am a special witness of him in all the world just as were Peter and Paul James and John. I testify that he is the living son of the living God, that he came to do the will of the Father, our Father, and in every word and deed he was perfect. He is Lord and Master of us all. He now sits upon the throne of grace on the right hand of God and is there our advocate, our mediator, our high priest of good things to come. He extends to all of us a personal invitation to come to him. Come whatever our fears or failings or circumstances or disappointments. Just come to him. The concluding invitation of the Book of Mormon is my concluding invitation to you. Come unto Christ, the Holy One of Israel. Come unto Christ and be perfected in him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. program of inspirational music and spoken word. We bring you the Mormon Tabernacle Choir from historic Nauvoo, Illinois, with Craig Jessup, Mac Wilberg, and Barlow Bradford conducting the choir. Guests, Enoch Train, organist John Longhurst, and the spoken word given by Lloyd Newell.
Nauvoo the Beautiful, the frontier settlement was called, and for one brief shining moment, no more than a few years really, it was the embodiment of happiness. In a few short months, forced to abandon their homes, the settlers of Nauvoo would cross the great Mississippi River, seeking a new home in the American West. 